Okay, why get baptized? First reason, and it's a good reason for doing anything, is we do it out of obedience to our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. That should, that should be enough, just saying that Yeshua tells us to do it, and we want to obey what Yeshua tells us to do. Where does he instruct us on this? Turn with me to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. 28. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, at the end of the chapter, Yeshua has already risen from the dead. He's meeting with now the 11 disciples. And he gives instructions. In English, we usually call this the Great Commission. But he was instructing his disciples to go and do after he left. So starting in verse 18, reading Yeshua's words, he says to them, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So in this passage we have a command, but we have a pattern actually also as well. He tells them to go, to teach, literally to make disciples, teach people the word of God so that they understand it, that they can grow in it. But the first step is salvation. Show people the word of God that they can see how to be saved. Teach them the gospel. So go, the first command is to go, you're to go to people to teach them the word, make disciples, and then baptize them. So the commands of Yeshua. And this is the pattern that we see even to go, to teach, and to baptize throughout the book of Acts. We see this pattern a lot. We're just going to look at two examples in the book of Acts, seeing how his disciples obeyed this command. Let's look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, there is an Ethiopian eunuch. And he's there and he's actually reading the prophet Isaiah. See in verse 28. Acts 8 28. And Philip, the Spirit actually brings Philip to, to this man. There's the first command, go. Go to the nations. Go to people. In verse 29, the Spirit said unto Philip, those words, good in English at least, go near. Go to this man. Join thyself to his chariots. Go speak to him. Here's a man that was already reading Isaiah. He was already reading Isaiah 53. But he did not understand. Philip goes to him in verse 30. He asks them, do you understand what you're reading? And what's his response? In verse 31, he says, how can I? Except some, some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And so Philip obeys. He goes to this man. He shows him. He follows with him there in the book of Isaiah. And he teaches him. He explains to him who the prophet is talking about. He asks the question in verse 34. So Philip says, I pray you of whom speaks the prophet this, of himself or some other man? So Philip went to this man, obeyed the command to go, and it says in verse 35 that Philip opened his mouth, he spoke, and he spoke from the scriptures. He began at the same scripture, it says, and preached unto him Yeshua. 
And so it appears as he explains the passage that this man comes to a saving faith. He, he believes that this is talking about Yeshua. Because as we come down to verse 36, they came to water. So we see the command to go, to teach. The beginning point is teaching them the scriptures that they can be saved and then baptize. And so they were going, and, it, and he says, the eunuch says, here is water. What, 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 what does hinder me to be baptized? What's preventing me? Is there anything stopping me from being baptized? And here's the important criteria for the baptism. Philip said unto him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ, that Yeshua HaMashiach, is the Son of God. He made a confession of faith. And that was all that was required to be baptized according to this pattern, because we see in verse 38 that he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down, both of them, into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. So we see the obedience both by Philip and by the Ethiopian eunuch to be baptized. He went, taught him the scriptures, led him to salvation, and then baptized him. We see a similar pattern in Acts chapter 16. Acts 16. See in Acts 16, Paul and Silas in Philippi, they got put in prison. Starting at verse 25, we see them in prison. They were rejoicing, even there. That's a lesson even for us. What does it say in verse 25? They sang praises unto God. Sitting in prison. Sometimes it's hard for us to sing praises even when things are going good. Here he is in prison and he's... Praising God in song. Then what happens? An earthquake opens up the prison. And the, it says the keeper of the prison, the, the jail the jailer there, the keeper of the prison, he heard what happened. He came and he was ready to kill himself. It was a serious thing if a prisoner escaped from that Roman jail. What does Paul do? tells him, do yourself no harm, verse 28. We're all here. You don't need to kill yourself. You're not going to be punished for this. Not a single prisoner has left. And even in this, we see a obedience by Paul to go to this man. He didn't have to stick around. He could have left. He said, yeah, we're free. The Lord wanted us to be free. We're out of here. But he stayed. He went to this jailer and he prevented him from taking his own life. And once again, the pattern, go to the person, then teach them the word. Verse 30, first the, the jailer asked the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on Yeshua HaMashiach. And you shall be saved in your house. And then, so what do they do? It says verse 32, they did following the pattern. They go to the man and they teach him the scriptures, leading to his salvation. It says in verse 32, they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. They went with him, they taught him the scriptures, led to his salvation. And then the next, number three in the pattern, baptized. It took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. There's no reason to wait. We, we can wait. There's no time limit on it. But we see that the only requirement is salvation. We see that as a prerequisite, a requirement to be baptized is salvation. So I've met with Tali and Zoya, gone over salvation, their testimonies. And so based on their confessions of faith, I don't see anything preventing them 
from being baptized today. They want to do it out of obedience, number one. Be baptized out of obedience to the Lord's command. Follow his pattern. Number two, we baptize to testify of our identification with Yeshua. This is a way to identify ourselves with Yeshua. We identify with him. We've talked about this a lot in our congregation in the past couple months. A very name that we, we call ourselves. In English, we call ourselves Christians. In Hebrew, we call ourselves Mashiachim. But they're both coming from the exact same meaning. It's coming from that, that, that Greek word meaning, one who identifies as a follower of Yeshua. That's what it means when we use those words. The very thing we label ourselves as is talking about our identification as followers of Yeshua, of the Messiah. And so baptism is a way to publicly show this identification. Kali and Zoya want to show us publicly that they're identifying with Yeshua. And specifically, baptism shows us, it's a, it's a symbol to show us how we identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. With Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection. Because as we'll go over here in just a moment and go under the water and come out of the water, it's all a symbol. Under the water, we identify with his death, with his burial, and then coming out of the water, and don't worry, I'll bring you both out of the water, with his resurrection. But what is this identification? What does it mean when we say we identify with his death, death, burial, and resurrection? What does it mean for us exactly? To talk about that, let's go to Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. And Romans 6 shows us what baptism symbolizes, but it's interesting when it uses the word baptism, it's not necessarily talking about the water baptism. But still, everything we learn in this chapter can point us to how we identify with his death, burial, and resurrection symbolically through going in and out of the water. I think it'll be good for us just to read verses 1 to 10. It's kind of a long passage, but it gives us a good understanding. Paul says, what shall we say? So I'm in Romans 6, reading from verses 1 to 10. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? This is following off the idea from chapter 5. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. And in that he lives, he lives unto God. So what is Paul saying in all these, in this chapter really, about our relation to the identification with Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection? It says in verse 2, we're dead to sin. We died to sin. On the cross, Yeshua paid the penalty should have been us hanging there, paying the penalty for our own sins. The penalty is death. He paid that in our place. If we trust in that, if we, if we believe only in what he's done on the cross for us for salvation, he promises that we will be saved. But Yeshua dying on the cross from our sins, does that mean we no longer sin? Of course not. 
I'll testify to that. Keep your finger here if you just flip to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Let's keep in mind he's, he's writing this to believers. 1 John chapter 1, he's writing to believers. And in verse 8, he's saying to believers, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And in verse 10, he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And then to even further push the point in verse 9, it says, confess our sins as believers. It wouldn't be necessary unless we still sin. So we know that. We still sin. So going back to Romans 6 and verse 2, when it says we are, we're dead to sin, we've died to sin, what does that mean? It's not saying that we no longer sin. We just saw that. We know that. Rather, the whole point of Romans 6 is to show us as believers that we're no longer under the power and control of sin. We're no longer slaves to sin, as Paul puts it. Not as we were as unbelievers. And the language of this chapter of Romans 6 is focused on the idea that we are freed from the control of sin. It's not that we don't sin, but we aren't slaves to it anymore. It's why Paul says in verse 2, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's why he says in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified, that old tendency to sin is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, meaning no longer be enslaved to it, don't be slaves to sin. That's why he says in verse 7, for he that is dead is freed, from sin. Verse 11, saying that we are dead indeed unto sin. Verse 12, saying, let not sin therefore reign, have control over your mortal body, in your mortal body. And verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Paul uses these words to indicate we've been freed from that dominating force of sin in our lives. Again, we still sin, but we're no longer slaves to sin. God's given us freedom from the control of sin in our lives. And he's done it through Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection. So in baptism, we're identifying ourselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. We're acknowledging that his work on the cross has freed us from that slavery to sin. This is the freedom that God has given us. But how do we realize that freedom? And the key word is in verse 11. Verse 11, in English, we have the word reckon. So you can look at it in, in each of your languages. But this word, reckon, at the beginning of verse 11. I love this word because it's a math term. I love math, everything math related. And so this word means to, to determine something based on a mathematical process. Who likes who loved math in school? Any math? Very few. Green, I love math. Yeah. You're a math guy. A lot of people that don't like math and sometimes don't see the reason for taking all these levels of math. But why do they teach math in school? Is it just so you can know that one plus one equals two? It's good to know that one plus one equals two. But math teaches much more than that. Math teaches us analytical thinking. Math teaches our brains to be able to use the facts that we know and use them in a way to get to the correct conclusion. 
Okay, we use the facts that we know, follow the rules to get to the right conclusions. So in Romans 6, verses 1 to 10 are just all the facts. Paul's not really telling us to do much in these first 10 verses. He's just stating the facts of what has happened to us in salvation. Fact, we're dead to sin, verse 2. Fact, verse 6, our old man is crucified with Yeshua. Fact, verse 7, we're freed from sin. These are all facts. And then he comes down to verse 11. Take these facts and now reckon these facts to be true. By a mathematical process. Take these facts and determine the correct conclusion. Knowing all these things. And then take action. The correct conclusion and the correct action to take is then in verses 11 to 13. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It says, no, what I've done for you on the cross, that you are truly freed from the control of sin, and yield yourself to these facts. Consider them to, to really be true, and submit. So Tali and Zoya, as you go under the water, it will remind us of Yeshua's death and burial. And that through his death on the cross, we're now dead to sin. And we're freed from the slavery to sin. We're identifying ourselves with this reality as we read in Romans 6. And then as well, as you come up out of the water... We're reminded of our identification with his resurrection. Because in verse 4 of Romans 6, it says, As believers were raised to a newness of life. He said, We also should walk in newness of life. Yeshua has changed our lives. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we're made a new creation, a new creature. This happened when we got saved. This baptism that's going in the water doesn't do that. When we believed in Yeshua, that happened. This water baptism is simply testifying to what has already happened in the hearts and lives of Tali and Zoya. There's no spiritual power in this water. As far as I know, Yadash doesn't have any magical powder that they sprinkle in there. The spiritual part already happened at the point of salvation. The spiritual part happened when we saw our sins, realized we were sinners before a holy God, that we couldn't pay that penalty of death by ourselves. Yeshua, in his love, died in our place. Putting faith and trust in that alone is what saves us. And the water isn't magical. When you go under the water, when you come out of the water, you're not going to be anything new. You'll be wet, but you won't be any different than whatever you are now. Water baptism is just an outward symbol of what has already happened inside. It's a way for them to communicate that their lives have already changed. They have already identified themselves with Yeshua. They're already dead to sin. They already have a newness of life, all based on their faith in Yeshua. This is just a public way to tell others that this has happened. We have a newness of life. We're different after we trust in Yeshua. This word to baptize 
The Greeks also use this word to talk about baptizing material in the water. To, to dip clothing. They would take a white or whatever piece of clothing, dip it in colored water. Change it to red or blue or whatever. They would use the same word. So when they dipped it in, it went in as a white piece of clothing, came out as red or blue or whatever. There was a visible change in that piece of clothing. And that change for us spiritually, again, doesn't happen because of the baptism. It happens because of our faith in Yeshua. When we trusted in Yeshua, there was a visible change in our lives. We go from living one way to living a different way. And so again, it's why Paul says in verse 4, we are raised, we should also walk in newness of life. At the point of salvation, he's given us this newness of life. The baptism just reminds us of that. So again, why be baptized? Number one, to obey Yeshua's commands. He told us to do it. Number two, it's to testify of our identification with his death, burial, and resurrection. To testify that we're dead to sin, we're no longer slaves to sin. He's given us newness of life. Let's just look at one final reason for baptism. Baptism reminds us of our cleansing from sin. Again, baptism is a picture and symbol. It's an outward symbol to show what's already happened inside. This baptism is a symbolic way for Tali and Zoya to testify about what Yeshua has already done for them. We've already talked about what he's done for us in Romans 6. Well, there's one final thing I want to close with to remind us of. Baptism reminds us that Yeshua has cleansed us from our sins. Being dipped in water obviously carries with it the idea of being washed. Sin is often described as, in the scriptures as something dirty that needs to be washed, cleansed. In the Torah, as we look at all the temple system, all the ceremonial washings and cleansing and purifications, it all symbolized the need to be clean to come before a holy God. Sin is what separates unclean men and women from a holy and pure God. And lost sinners remain unwashed from their sins. They're not yet forgiven of their sins. Proverbs 30 verse 12 reminds us of that fact. Proverbs 30 verse 12. Proverbs 30, 12 says, There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. The lost remain unwashed from their sins. And no amount of water will wash away the dirt of our sins. Water baptism doesn't wash away our sins. What will wash away our sins? Yep, we're already saying of it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. So it reminds us what Yeshua has done for us. Christ paid to cleanse us from our sins. Let's just close with two verses. First one is in 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Verses 9 to 11. It says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? These are sinners that have not yet repented. These are sinners still in the filth of their sin. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves, of mankind nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. 
And such were some of you. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Yeshua. And by the Spirit of our God. Also, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. He loved us, and what did he do? He washed us from our sins in his own blood. Baptism reminds us that Yeshua has washed us from our sins with his own blood. So why are we baptizing Tali and Zoya today? Number one, they desire to do so out of obedience to what the Lord has commanded. They want to testify of their identification with Yeshua, with his death, burial, and resurrection. To testify that Yeshua has freed them from the power of sins, that they're no longer slaves to sin. That he's given us newness of life. Let each of us reckon that to be true in our own lives. And number three, let this time of baptism remind us we've been cleansed, we've been washed, we've been forgiven of our sins. We're not forgiven through the water. Rather, Yeshua has washed us from our sins in his own blood.